in this video i will talk about contribution technique and how to apply it on trees this video is part of a hybrid tutorial series that i am planning to add on my channel the video will only contain key insights for you to solve the problem however if you want to dive deep into the details you should read the blog that i have created for this particular video let's start with a very simple problem of finding the distance between any two nodes in a tree suppose it is node 2 and node 3 if you define d of q to be equal to the distance of this node from the root then it is easy to see that the distance between this node and this node is equal to this distance plus this distance minus 2 times this distance and this is nothing but the lca of these two nodes so if you know how to compute the lowest common ancestor you will be able to solve this problem but what if you don't know how to compute lca can you still solve this problem no but what if i ask you the distance between node x and x plus 1 does this make the problem any easier not really because node x and x plus 1 can be located anywhere in the tree so it doesn't really give us an advantage so this problem is as difficult as the last one but what if the tree has some special structure suppose that the nodes of the tree are numbered in dfs order that is when you were performing a dfs on the tree the first time you encounter a node you will assign it the minimum unassigned label this is one example of a tree which is in dfs order in this tree can you figure out the distance between node x and x plus 1 without using the algorithm to compute lca you will notice that the distance between node x and x plus 1 is 1 most of the time but there are some cases where it is not equal to 1 for example the distance between node 6 and node 7 is not equal to 1 so what is special about node 6 you will notice that node 6 is the last leaf of this subtree that is why its successor was not present in this subtree and that is why it had to travel upward but how do you figure out the last leaf of a subtree since the nodes are labeled in dfs order the last leaf will contain the maximum label in the subtree of this node therefore to locate the last leaf you just need to do a tree dp to figure out the maximum value in the subtree of any node since this was the last leaf its successor which is equal to 7 was not present in the subtree of this node that is why it had to rise up and then locate its successor but notice that the path between any two node x and x plus 1 will either be a downward path of length 1 or the path will rise up from the last leaf of a subtree it will rise up and then it will fall down exactly once to its successor so you can conclude that downward paths are always of length 1 and they are always the terminal edge of the path so any path between x and x plus 1 either has length 1 and is a downward path or it starts from the last leaf rises up and then falls down exactly once so now instead of computing the distance between x and x plus 1 let us change our perspective and look at the edges instead of the nodes so this is the contribution technique where we will think about how many paths will a particular edge contribute to consider the edge parent to child how many downward paths will it be a part of you can see that it will be a part of exactly one downward path why because the downward paths are terminal edges so if a path is a downward path then it means that it needs to end over here but if it needs to end over here where it would have started 
it would have started at its predecessor there is only one location where the path ending at this vertex could have started now does that mean that its predecessor is here not necessarily because its predecessor might be here it might have climbed up and then fallen down exactly once so we conclude that every edge is part of exactly one downward path but how many upward paths is an edge part of so consider this edge how many upward paths will it be part of so you know that any path rises up and then falls down exactly once as soon as it finds its successor now if you consider this edge all the nodes in the subtree of this node they will locate their successor so they will start from here they will rise up looking for their successor but since the successor for all the nodes except one node will already be present in the tree they will just fall down immediately before this before reaching this vertex so the only node that will not be able to find its successor is the last leaf so from the last leaf of this subtree the path will rise and from this point the successor hasn't been located yet so it will rise further and then go to its successor so you can conclude that every node is part of exactly one downward path and that downward path should originate from its predecessor and it is part of exactly one upward path and that upward path should originate from the last leaf of that subtree if you are still not clear about it you can refer to the blog where i have added more details about why this is true let us take an example consider the edge between vertex 1 and vertex 4 how many downward paths will it be a part of you can notice that if it is a part of a downward path then the journey must end over here so it must have started at node 3 and you can see why that is true because from this last leaf the journey started it rises and then it falls down exactly once and how many upward paths is it a part of you can see that it is exactly one because this is the last leaf so from this last leaf it will try to locate its successor by rising up and at this point it hasn't found its successor so it will cross this edge and then go to its successor the code for this is pretty simple first of all we figure out how to compute the last leaf by doing a simple tree dp then when we want to process an edge we already saw that it is part of exactly one downward path that originates from its predecessor and it is also part of exactly one upward path that originates from the last leaf so we increase the contribution of both of those vertices and then to find the distance we simply process all the edge and print the distances that have been accumulated so far now consider that same tree where the vertices are labeled in dfs order and assume that all of these edges now have a weight assigned to it however you do not know any of these weights yet but you do know that the sum of all of these weights is equal to w now if i were to ask you to compute the maximum possible distance between node x and node x plus 1 with the freedom that you can assign any edge weight to an unrevealed edge as long as you make sure that the total weight remains w then you can see that the maximum distance between any two nodes will be equal to w because on this path you can select any one vertex you can assign the weight w to it and you can assign 0 and 0 to it but what happens when i reveal one edge at a time and after revealing a subset of the edges i ask you to compute the maximum possible distance between node x and x plus 1 can you do it efficiently so this problem appeared in code forces round 969 as problem e and this is the problem description if you want a formal statement of what the problem is trying to ask although the problem statement might look a bit intimidating at first this solution is very simple 
So take a minute to pause this video and think about how you would approach this problem. Suppose a subset of edges have already been revealed and the total sum of unrevealed edges is equal to R. Then if you consider a path between node x and x plus 1, either all the edges on this path has already been revealed. In that case, the answer is equal to the sum of all the revealed edges or there is at least one unrevealed edge on this path and therefore you can increase the answer by placing the entire weight R over here. Therefore, we need a way to track the number of free edges on each path and we also need a way to track the total sum of revealed edges on each path. However, previously we saw that every edge contributes to exactly one downward path that originates from its predecessor and one upward path that originates from the last leaf in its subtree. Therefore, updating the contribution in O of 1 can be done. So this is the code. You can see that initially all the edges are free edges. So every time you introduce an edge, you simply increase the free edge count for the predecessor and the last leaf. Then as soon as an edge is revealed, you need to remove a free edge. So in the predecessor, the free edge count will decrease and in the last leaf, the free edge count will decrease. But you also need to track the sum of the revealed edges on the path. So the predecessor will have some new revealed edge and the last leaf will also have some new revealed edge. And if you want to process the queries, you can simply get the vertex and then remove that free edge. And to compute the answer, you can simply iterate over all the vertices. And if it has at least one free edge, then you assign the extra weight to it. The time complexity of this code is O of n square. Why? Because after revealing each edge, we are iterating over all the paths and recalculating its contribution depending upon whether or not a free edge is available on that path. Can we improve the overall time complexity to O of n instead of O of n square? It can be done if you think about Kahn's topological sort algorithm. Notice that in this algorithm you face a similar situation where you always need to keep track of the number of unlocked vertices that is all the vertices whose in degree is now zero. So in this topological sort algorithm do you iterate the entire vertices list every time to check how many or which vertices have in degree as 0? No, because you notice the fact that the in degree is a strictly decreasing function because once the in degree becomes 0, this node is deleted from the graph and it will never come back. Therefore, every time you delete a node, you immediately check its neighbor. If one of its neighbor has an in degree of 0 currently, you immediately take it at the back of your queue to do the uh, topological sort. So you can notice the same thing over here. Initially, you can say that all the paths originating from any of these nodes are unlocked, right? Because all of the edges are free edges. But every time you add an edge or every time you reveal an edge, this edge now gets locked. Therefore, it will lock the Therefore, it will decrease the free edge count of its predecessor and its last leaf. When this edge gets revealed, it will decrease the free edge count of its predecessor and last leaf. So you see that the free edge count is always a decreasing function. Therefore, if you keep track of two sets, right? So let's divide the vertices into two sets. So there is a locked set and there is an unlocked set. So all the vertices start from this set. So all the n vertices are placed in this set. Then you will notice that the transfer of elements will only happen from the unlocked set to the, lo to the locked set. So every time you add an edge, you decrease the free edge count of two vertices in the unlocked set. And then after decreasing the free edge count, 
as soon as the free edge number hits zero you simply transfer it from here to here then how do you figure out the answer so the answer would simply be the sum of the edge weights of the locked set plus the sum of weights of the unlocked set that have already been revealed plus unlocked set size into remain why because unlock if this size of unlocked set is equal to 5 it means that there are 5 paths where there is at least one free edge so in all of these paths you can attach the remaining weight so using this simple formula you don't have to keep track of uh, everything you can just maintain two variables to keep track of the number of free edges the sum of the locked edges and the sum of the unlocked edges this is the final code for this problem adding a free edge is same as before for the predecessor and the last leaf you simply increase the free edge count when you want to reveal an edge for the predecessor as well as the last leaf the free edge count will naturally decrease by one but the sum of weights of the revealed edges will increase by w which is equal to the weight of the revealed edge then if the free edges count has become equal to zero and this is the same pattern that you use in topological sort you transfer this element from the unlocked set to the locked set then you simply process all the edges initially all of them are free edges and then every time a vertex is revealed you trans make that transfer from the unlocked set to the locked set and the final answer as we discussed earlier should be equal to the locked set sum unlocked set sum plus on all the unlocked path you can assign a weight equal to r contribution technique is nothing but a change in perspective just by switching our focus from vertices to edges we were able to solve a 2000 rated problem with ease this technique is very powerful and can help you solve a lot of problems in fact i also have another video on my channel that talks about contribution technique you can take a look if you think you really understand contribution technique now here is an exercise for you let me know your answer in the comment section below so at the start of the video i told you that it is not possible to find the distance between u and v without referring to an lc algorithm but what if you I ask you to calculate the sum of pairwise distance. Can you solve this problem using contribution technique and you are not allowed to use LCA? Let me know your approach in the comment section down below. You will notice that I have skipped a lot of details in this video and that is intentional because if you really want to get good at solving a hard code forces problem, you need to reflect upon things right give it time reflect upon things and that is why i have created a supplementary blog for this video that contains a bit more detail than what is discussed in this video so that you can read the blog at your own pace and figure things out by yourself as you read along so the link of this blog as well as the code slides and some practice problems associated with this video will be present in the YouTube description. If you like the format of this video, do let me know in the comment section down below so that I can continue this hybrid tutorial series.